If you were asked to think about muscle development, the first thing that would probably come to mind would be hitting the gym. In Professor DeVoto's lab at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut, muscle development means much more than just toning your biceps. Professor DeVoto and his lab assistants are studying how your muscle cells develop long before that trip to the gym. They are studying how muscle cells develop when life first begins. For me, developmental biology is the study of how cells and tissues develop their shape and their identity, how an amorphous group of cells in the early embryo can be transformed over developmental time into a group of cells that have distinct functions. We're actually specifically interested in how the muscle develops. So how the muscle is specified to become a muscle cell, um, how the cells move to become positioned in the right place to be specified as a muscle cell, um, how they form fibers. During the development of the skeletal system, cells in the embryo have decisions to make to follow a fate of becoming a muscle cell, for example, or a bone cell. Within skeletal muscle, there are muscles that are used for rapid uh, movements. Those muscles are called fast twitch muscles. They contract quickly and fatigue rather quickly. And they contrast with slow muscles, which are used for steady locomotion or for posture. The mechanism by which cells adopt a certain fate, say muscle or bone, frequently involves the environmental signals. The environment in which a cell finds itself will determine its fate. There's several classes of signals, but one of the most common types of signal is a secreted protein, much like a hormone. In develop developmental biology, we call them uh, growth factors that are released from one tissue and determine the fate of cells in another tissue. Once the cell receives these signals, it activates particular genes which um, play a role in differentiating that cell. One of the signaling molecules that we study is the uh, signaling molecule called hedgehog. It's a secreted protein that was first identified in, from work in fruit flies in Drosophila and has now been shown to regulate the fate of a lot of different cells in the early embryo of mammals and, and, and including humans. Rather than looking at actual human embryos, Professor DeVoto uses zebrafish as a model organism. Zebrafish are really great for watching development occur because they're transparent and they go from a single cell to an embryo with a beating heart within 24 hours, which is really fast. And you can watch it all under the scope. So it's a really neat model for studying development. The zebrafish is very easy to keep in large numbers. As you can see around me, we have about 3,000 animals. Because we can get large numbers of animals, we can isolate mutations which disrupt muscle development and study the genes that, play, that are required for developing into uh, muscle fibers. One typical experiment is designed to ask where do muscle cells come from and what is the relationship between different kinds of muscle cells. I have been working um, and gathering some preliminary data because I've applied for a grant looking at how um, there's a gene that we're studying called Sonic Hedgehog which yeah, it is from the, the uh, video game characters <laughs> to see how hedgehog um, tells the muscle cell to stop dividing and become a muscle cell instead of a, a kind of a stem cell and I was looking at the gene that turns the cell cycle off, that tells the cell to stop dividing. So I wanted to see where this gene is expressed and when it turns on in these muscle stem cells. Betsy Dobbs McAuliffe is trying to see how muscle cells develop. She can track the development of specific cells within the zebrafish embryo by making muscle cells express a red fluorescent protein. Once the cells are developed, she'll be able to see the fluorescent cells when she looks at the zebrafish under the microscope. To prepare for the experiment, Betsy fills a glass pipette with a coating sequence for red fluorescent protein. First, she collects eggs from the zebrafish tanks. The eggs have been laid in the past 10 minutes. 
she loads several embryos in each lane of the injection tray. An injection tray can hold up to 200 zebrafish embryos. Then, she injects the single cell with the DNA coding sequence for red fluorescent protein. She has to work quickly because the cells are already beginning to differentiate. She needs to inject the embryos when there is only one cell. In 24 hours, the embryo will be about the size of a letter on a penny and have a beating heart that is already circulating blood throughout its tiny body. After 24 hours, Betsy can look at the embryos under the microscope. The microscope she is using will allow her to detect fluorescence. The cells that are fluorescent are the cells that are developing into muscle cells. The highlighted portion of the embryo is the zebrafish's beating heart. This part of the embryo contains the neural tube. Those are the somites, also known as cell bodies. Underneath the embryo is the remainder of the yolk. From those experiments, we can identify which cells remain as a quiescent sort of uh, precursor population and then differentiate into muscle fibers right away. So we could start looking at um, the role of different genes, such as sonic hedgehog, in patterning those cells to become muscle fibers. And the hope is that if we can understand how hedgehog is triggering muscle cell development, we can use that knowledge in combination with the stem cells that are being developed by other scientists to regulate the stem cell behavior so that they, when they're transplanted into a patient with muscular dystrophy, those cells form muscle fibers and don't, for example, keep proliferating and form a muscle tumor or form other cells, blood cells or, um, or brain cells, inappropriate, in inappropriate locations. It's, uh, it's a real puzzle, that, uh, a real intellectual puzzle that we're trying to solve here. How, how is it that uh, an embryo forms? How does an amorphous group of cells that is really, all the cells are indistinguishable, how do they, how does a pattern arise out of those um, groups of cells? And at its heart, what we're trying to do is just figure out this really fascinating puzzle. And we hope that as we do so, the knowledge that we gain will also help uh, patients with uh, debilitating diseases.